In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word love appears 36 times in our readings from 1 John and the Gospel of John. 36 times. It is a drumbeat. It is a poet's refrain. The important bit of knowledge that you can't seem to get into a child's head and you weary for repeating. Love one another. Love is of God. We love by abiding in God. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Love is my commandment. It is really so simple, wrote Dostoevsky. The main thing is to love your neighbor as yourself. Once you do that, you will discover at once how everything shall fall into place. Yet I don't know about you, but I think the word love is much abused and overused. And sometimes I feel that way when I read 1 John, which sounds like a Montessori primer. <laughs> what is love, we might want to ask. And just how do we love our neighbor? It's pretty clear to me that love is more than an emotion. There may be absolutely no emotion whatever involved when we act in loving ways. And sometimes emotion clouds wise judgment. So we might want to think of love as a verb, a way of acting, a way of being in the world. In our reading from the book of Acts, we find Peter and the other early Jewish believers in Christ someplace where they had no business being. They are in the home of a Roman centurion named Cornelius, which violated a mountain of Jewish law and cultural prohibition. Already, the seeds of Christ's gospel are transforming how those early Christians relate to other people. And to their absolute astonishment, Cornelius and the Gentiles respond to the gospel and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter baptizes them, everybody rubbing their eyes in complete disbelief, and the church is born. One section of humanity recognizes the humanity of another group of people previously considered to be outsiders, previously considered to be beyond the pale. That is one form of love. Specifically, love of neighbor. You may remember the 19th century poem by Godfrey Sachs about the six blind men of Indostan who stumble onto an elephant. And the first man falls against the elephant's side and declares, this creature is very like a wall. And the second man grabs a tusk and proclaims, no, this creature is very like a spear. And the third man lays hands on the elephant's trunk and says, the elephant is a species of snake and so on until the poem concludes. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. And that's kind of the way it is when we overemphasize one insight to the exclusion of other essential understandings, which happens all the time in religion, in politics, do you think in politics? In communities, in churches. Neighbor love requires a more holistic and open-minded approach 
to the world and to other people. So our scripture readings today seem to want to anchor us in one another in holistic fashion, which is often the meaning of love in the New Testament. Love, for those believe, who believe that Jesus is the Christ from God, means a relationship of obligation toward all others loved by the divine parent. A particular obligation to those of the household of faith, but also duty to the neighbor who grasps the tail of the elephant and perceives it to be only a rope. So we think of love as an emotion, but the New Testament is more inclined to view love as a web of obligation and duty flowing toward other people because of the fact of our common parent, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Joseph Conrad's novel, Lord Jim, which many of you have read, we meet a young idealist who wants to prove his courage and his heroism. And so he joins the Marines and he heads off to far eastern seas. Everyone is drawn to Jim. I liked his appearance, says the narrator Marlowe. He came from the right place. He was one of us. He was the kind of fellow who would, on the strength of his looks, you would leave the deck in charge of him, figuratively and professionally speaking. That's emotion talking. Jim is one of us. And we like him all the more for Lord Jim's sense of superiority over the slovenly captain of the ship and the drunken crew and the 800 Arab pilgrims on board as human cargo. But then there's a shipwreck. Jim, the romantic, decides to let the passengers go down with the ship without waking them up because the shipwreck has occurred in the middle of the night. He vows as a romantic, as an idealist, to himself go down with the ship. And he is contemptuous of the captain and the drunken crew as he watches them try to free the lifeboats. And the captain and the crew succeed in freeing the lifeboats. And at the last minute, as the ship begins to sink, Jim jumps in to one of the lifeboats. Jim is now in the same boat with those he disdained. A flawed human being who has revealed an uneven character despite his pretensions to heroics and nobility. Jim is one of us. Perhaps this is where Christian love is supposed to begin. Not with a sentimental attachment to people because of their attractiveness or because of who we idealize them to be, but with the hard truth that every one of us is flawed. That may be what the Bible means when it talks about election. God is always choosing people for particular goals without respect for merit or achievement. God chooses the Israelites who weren't especially moral, were not especially culturally influential. Moses is a felon with a speech impediment. David is a dreamy shepherd boy. Amos is a rustic herdsman. Mary is a teenage mother. Jesus is from backwater Nazareth. Paul shows more fervor for inquisition than a Spanish cardinal. Magdalene has a checkered past. Election is the call of love to flawed people, to everyone in the lifeboat with the slovenly captain and the drunken crew and Lord Jim as they watch the ship they have just abandoned carry 800 people down to a watery death. And we would like to think that that is not our crowd there in the lifeboat, but it is, and God loves us anyway. 
everything began there in Cornelius house but it didn't stop there by the year 300 AD through the conversion of both the privileged and the underclass Christianity grew up to 10% of the Roman population Rodney Stark writing in his Princeton University Press book the rise of Christianity points to two factors first he says Christianity promoted liberating social relations between the sexes, within the family, and in the larger culture. It elevated the status of women and children, and people traditionally disenfranchised. Secondly, when epidemics struck, as they often did, Christians, unlike pagan culture, would care for the sick and for the dying. Christians gathered babies exposed for infanticide and raised them as their own. They provided a better happier, more secure way of life. And Christians didn't accomplish this by talking about the sociological implications of the gospel. They did it in response to a command from their Lord to love. The command of love is the vocation of the church. When we live the commandment, it means a better, happier, more secure way of life with positive social benefits as an added perk. In my research, I recently came across a letter sent to our Lord by the Galilean consultants management firm. <laughs> Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All have taken our battery of tests and submitted to interviews with our psychologists. It is the opinion of our staff that most of your nominees lack background, education, and aptitude for the enterprise you are undertaking. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew totally lacks leadership qualities. The brothers James and John, sons of the undistinguished Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. John seems awfully soft. Thomas is a skeptic who would damage morale. Matthew, we must inform you, has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> James and Thaddeus are political radicals. One, however, shows great potential. A resourceful man, he meets people well. He has a strong business sense. He has contacts in high places. He is motivated and ambitious. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your CEO and comptroller. All others are unfit. Christ shows the apostles knowing the power of love would transform them. And now we are elected by God to learn the ways of love. You learn to study by studying. You learn to play the lute by playing the lute. You learn to dance by dancing. You learn to swim by swimming, said the 16th century divine Francis de Sales. And just so you learn to love God and you learn to love your neighbor by loving. If you want to love God, love him. And go on loving him more and more and more. Press forward continually. So welcome to the church. A lifeboat full of the inadequate those elected to take initiative in loving others. You are no more fit than Moses, or David, or Magdalene, or the Apostles, or Lord Jim. You have been elected despite your character, or maybe because of your character. It is really so simple wrote Dostoevsky. The main thing is to love your neighbor as yourself. Once you do that, 
you will discover at once how everything shall fall into place. Amen.